I have six points in my lesson, but the good news is I'm only doing three today, and I'll do three next week. He became like us. As Brother Quantum read for us in Philippians chapter 4, or Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 4, you notice in that passage it tells us twice that he was going to come in the likeness of man. And then it also says when he came, he was in the form or the appearance of a man. Brother, and I know that all of us understand that the Bible teaches us Jesus is more than just a man. We know that the Bible teaches us that he is the divine, the son of the most high God. But we also know from that passage where Paul writes to us that he came to this earth in the same form that you and I are in, in the physical flesh. And so as we think about those things, I want us not to think about Jesus as the Son of God today. I know that that will be hard for a lot of you to do to block that out of your mind. But I want you to think of Jesus today on the other side as a man. His physical nature on this earth. And so what we want to very simply do this morning is to examine the thought, He became like us. Because He did in so many ways. And so this morning, let me share with you three of the ways that he became like us. Number one, he became like us in his liability to human suffering or to human infirmities, whichever way you want to look at this. Now, I want you to think about these infirmities that Jesus suffered. He suffered in the same way that you and I suffer. And we're going to examine the first one more so in a moment as we think about the second part of this thought. But I want you to notice some things here in Matthew 21 beginning in verse 18. In the morning he returned to the city. He hungered. How many of you have ever been hungry? And I, I don't mean just that little rumble in your stomach. I'm talking about hungry, where it didn't matter what they put in front of you, that you probably would eat it. I don't like Brussels sprouts. I don't like broccoli. I don't like cauliflower. There are a lot of things in this life that I don't like, food-wise. But I guarantee you, if I was hungry enough, I would eat what's put in front of me. Now, I may have just given my wife an idea. <laughs> she may say, well, I'm going to get him to eat this, because if he's, if he's really hungry, he'll eat what I put in front of him. The good thing is I know how to cook, so I can fix whatever I want. But just think about the fact that if you are that hungry, Jesus himself was hungry as he returned into the city. But then if you go to John chapter 4 and verse 7, in this discourse where Jesus is traveling, and he stops at the well in Samaria, and he, and he runs into the Samaritan woman, what did he say? I thirst. I'm thirsty. How many of you, in the hot West Tennessee heat and humidity of the middle of July or August, how many of you have been thirsty? I'm not a big water drinker. I don't drink as much sweet tea as I used to. But when I'm thirsty, nothing hits the spot like a good cold drink that will quench the thirst. Now I want you to think about our Savior, Jesus. I want you to think about the man, Jesus, as he was traveling along the way. 
He began to get thirsty. He didn't have a nice automobile with air conditioning, you know, that's adjustable on both sides like we have. Jesus' mode of transportation was generally his two feet. And as he walked along, he got thirsty. And so he stopped to refresh himself. Well, go over to Luke chapter 8 and look at verse 23. There in this context, they were on the ship, he and the others. And it says, and he fell asleep. Any of you all like sleep? Any of you all ever stayed up, uh, let's go 96 hours. How about 128 hours? What's the longest period of time that you have stayed awake in a continuous cycle? How well did you sleep when you finally went to bed? You understand? Jesus as a human suffered those same things we go through. He was hungry. He was thirsty. He got tired. He got weary. And so he was down resting. But then also notice secondly here that Jesus could be tempted through the means of his physical needs. Now, I put Matthew chapter 4. You can go to Luke chapter 4 if you wish. But there in Matthew chapter 4, after he was baptized by John, he went out into the wilderness. And what did he do for 40 days? Did he not fast? And in his fasting, the purpose of that fasting was so it would draw him closer to the Father. Someone says, well, that's awful strange that he would need to be drawn closer to his heavenly Father. Remember, he was a man. And he's showing in that passage where it talks about him fasting and drawing closer to his God. He's showing us the importance of taking time and meditate and spend growing closer to God. Mm -hmm. But after those 40 days, the Bible says that Satan took him. And began to tempt him. We have three recorded temptations. I think there were probably more, but that's my personal belief. But we have three recorded temptations for us. And the very first one came after Satan saw that he was hungry. And Satan looked at him and he very simply said, You see that stone over there? I know you have the power to turn it into a loaf of bread. What did Jesus respond? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. <clears throat> Brethren, are we tempted in our physical needs to give in and to do what Satan wants us to do? Yep. Jesus would not do that. Although he was tempted in those physical things, just like we are. You see, he became like us to show us you can overcome. But number two this morning as I think about he became like us, he became like us in the limitation of his knowledge while on the earth. And someone might say, now, wait, 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 wait a minute, brother. Jesus was the Son of God. He knew everything. That is not what the Bible teaches. If you go back to the only passage in the Bible that I can see where it talks about Jesus' childhood in Luke chapter 2. I want you to notice here in Luke chapter 2 in these two verses, particularly verse 40 and then in verse 52. Notice what the scripture says about Jesus the man, the child. It says in verse 40, And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. He grew in what? Wisdom. He grew in his knowledge of what his surroundings were. And then I come down to verse 52, the end of the chapter. That's the passage in the verse that we all know so well, right? That is the one that we know where it says, And Jesus increased in wisdom 
in stature and in favor with God and man. He grew in his knowledge. He grew in his physical stature just like you and I. How do you obtain knowledge? How do you obtain knowledge? I suggest that Jesus obtained knowledge by attending and studying the things that were put before Him. If you and I want to have knowledge of whatever subject you choose, do you not have to put time and effort into learning that subject? You see, Jesus, as He grew, and He had that limited knowledge, and He had to gain it. How many of you today, maybe I shouldn't ask this. I don't like to make anybody lie. But how many of you know everything there is to know about every subject that exists in the world today? I don't even see Chip raising his hand. He's one of the smartest men I know. None of us can know everything about everything. But the things that we know about, we've put our time and our effort into learning, haven't we? And it even further is illustrated in Mark chapter 9 and verse 21. If you turn over to that passage, or turn back to that passage, notice the context which is here in this passage. Where it talks about this man who had a problem. It says, when they brought him to him and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him and he fell on the ground and wobbled, foaming at the mouth. So Jesus asked the father a question. How long has this been happening to him? Jesus' knowledge was limited, folks, because he had to ask the father, how long has this been going on? And the father said from childhood. If Jesus was all-knowing about everything that was going on on the earth, would he have not known that young man had been stricken from his child? And we can point to other examples of where the knowledge of Jesus is limited onto the earth. But the one thing that strikes me the most about his limited knowledge refers to the fact that, his limited, that he had a limited knowledge of the future. You remember, you would think that the one who came from heaven, the divine Son of God, that he would know when the second coming was, right? And what did he say? He said there is no one, no man, no one, not the angels, not even the Son knows the time. But he says, only the Father. Mark chapter 13 and verse 32. You see, I think the same is true. Jesus had limited knowledge to show us the fact that even though we may have limited knowledge, we can have enough knowledge to travel from the earthly land to the glory land. We can know the things that we need to do to leave this earth of sin and of sorrow. Mm -hmm. That we can know the things that we need to do in order to ensure our citizenship is in heaven. Mm -hmm. We have every tool available. As a matter of fact, I say every tool. Let me rephrase. We have the only to gain the knowledge to leave this earth and go to the heavenly land. Jesus did have knowledge about a lot of things, didn't he? For example, Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 7, he said, you know, there are two ways. There are these two roads. He said, one will lead you to destruction and one will lead you to eternal life. And he even tells us, that he defines to us that road that leads to eternal death. He said, it is a wide and broad way. And he says, I know this, the majority of folks are going to be lost because they're going to go down that road because it's the easy road. Right. It's not very hard to find. Right. 
But then he says, the second road, the road that leads to eternal life, he said that is the road that is narrow and straight. And he says there's not going to be very many who go down that road because it requires effort. It requires you to learn of what you must do in order to travel that road. You see, it challenges us to gain knowledge. But number three this morning, he became like us in his dependence upon others. And let me say this. As I think about how Jesus became dependent on others, how many of you have heard me personally say, if you've been here very often, you've heard me say this. How many of you have heard me say that we can't get to heaven by ourselves? You know why I can't get to heaven by myself? Because Jesus taught me I have to depend on you. We must depend on each other as Jesus learned that he needed to depend on others. Think about Jesus as a child. Who did he depend on? This is not rocket science, folks. It, that's an easy question to answer, isn't it? Who do our children depend on as they're growing up? Don't they depend on their parents? A baby. Who changes a baby's diaper? Mom. I know most of you say, and the moms will say, well, I do. Mom and dad. Mom more so than dad, probably. Well, probably definitely. But doesn't that child learn to depend on the parents to do the very basic functions that we as adults take for granted? Or how about that child growing up? When you think about how that he is dependent upon his parents. How about the food that's placed before them? Who provides and places the food before them? The parents. Who's the one who makes sure that they are clean and fresh smelling when you take them over to grandma's house so grandma and grandpa can spoil them before they send them home? Right. I don't think any of you are missing what I'm trying to say. We understand that in this life, a child depends upon the parents. Folks, Jesus was dependent upon Joseph and Mary to take care of him. And we see not only did they provide for his physical needs, but they also provided for his spiritual needs, didn't they? You remember the passage we looked at just a minute ago in Luke chapter, Luke chapter 2? Where had they taken Jesus? Where had Jesus gone? Had he not gone to Jerusalem for the feast? And while he was there, where was he found? He was sitting amongst the lawyers and the smart folks. And what did Joseph and Mary do? Remember they wandered off? And they went a day's journey. Uh-oh. Jesus became, began to become independent. Because when they came back, they were in a state of frenzy. Why did you do this to us? And Jesus says, don't you know that I must be about my Notice it says fathers with a father's business and the F is capitalized. He realizes that he needs to grow spiritually and become dependent upon his heavenly father. Yes, he became dependent on others. Well, think about what he was in his ministry. As he was walking the face of the earth in those three years or so that he was ministered, that he began his earthly ministry, who did he depend on? Did he not depend on the apostles and other disciples to help him accomplish the work that he was trying to do? Maybe the greatest example of that you can find in Matthew chapter 16. 
when Jesus was in the region of Caesarea Philippi. Remember? And he asked the, the ones, the apostles that were there, he said, who do men say that I am? Who, who, who do the folks in the world think that I am? Right? Well, how did they learn who he was? How did they develop their opinion that he was either Elijah or, or John the Baptist or, or one of the other great prophets? How did they know? How did they learn that? Was it not because of those who he surrounded himself who carried his message? Or how about, how about the fact that when he said, well, who do you say that I am? When he asked that great question. And Peter answered and said, well, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus went on to say to him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar -Jonah. For flesh and blood hath not revealed this to you, but my Father, who is in heaven. And upon this rock I will build my church. Based on what? The recognition and the acknowledgement. The great confession that Jesus was God's Son. That's what the basic premise of the church is built on. But wait a minute. How was that plan put into action? How was, how was the church that he promised to build based on that confession, when did it come into existence? Was it not after he had already ascended into heaven? Go to Acts chapter 1. He had ascended into heaven and a church that he promised to establish had not been established yet. But what did Jesus tell the apostles and the others? He said, you all go to Jerusalem and you wait until you have been endowed with this power. And in Acts chapter 2, we see the power come, the Holy Spirit. It came. How did, who did Jesus depend on to spread the message of his death, his burial, and his resurrection to cause 3,000 on the day of Pentecost to repent and to be baptized. Who did he depend on? Did he not depend on the apostles? You see, Jesus teaches us that he became like us because he becomes dependent on others. Brethren, understand something. No matter how hard you try, no matter what you think you can do as an individual, you can never accomplish anything by yourself. You must depend on others. So here it is, the self-existent one. He learned what it meant. To depend on others. Hey, I encourage you. Let's lean on one another. You've heard me say this, and I know many of you believe this. In the trials and in the difficulties of your life, what is it that has carried you through? <coughs> Has it been the words of encouragement from your brethren? Has it been because others around you have prayed for you? You can't get away from being dependent on others. Jesus still to this day is dependent on us to go into all the world and take the message of the saving gospel. That's what he depends on even to this day. And so as I close the lesson this morning, I'm reminded, and I put the whole story up, but the story is told of a young boy who during the war, the war years, he would look at this picture of his daddy. His daddy had left when the young man, the young man was just a baby. After several years, the young man forgot the person. But he would often say to himself, 
If only my father could step out of that picture and be real. You might say, what's that have to do with anything? I want you to know this morning that on a sad day of sin, when mankind had almost forgotten God, <coughs> what happened? Jesus, God, stepped into the world in the form of His Son. He became like us. He became like us. And He became like us ultimately for the greatest reason. And I have another sermon that I may do at some point called Why He Became Like Us. He became like us. He became a man so that we might live with Him someday. Mm -hmm. Brother, where is your eternity going to be spent? Are you going to be spending your eternity with the majority in the path that leads you to destruction and that path of eternal punishment being separated from God and that eternal tormenting place called hell. Or will you spend your eternity with the resurrected Christ in the glory of heaven? This morning, if you've not put Christ on in baptism, if you've heard the word in truth preach. Hopefully you can, can develop a faith in that word and seeing the need that you have to repent. Knowing that you can't please God in the life and the lifestyle that you're living now and you need a change. Leave the way of the world and begin to live the way of God. Will you make the confession identically to what Peter said? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Which, by the way, is repeat, repeated and basically repeated in Acts chapter 8 with the Ethiopian eunuch. Same, similar confession. Will you make that? Will you be immersed with him in that watery grave of baptism this morning? So you can contact the blood to have your sins washed away. Rising to walk in a new life. Or perhaps you've done that and you've let your life fall back into the way of the world. And you need to depend on your brethren this morning. You need to come confessing the sin that exists in your life. Again, repenting of those sins, desiring to change. I'm thankful God lets us change. Because I've been there. You've been there before. But your brethren can pray for you, can encourage you. But we don't know what your need is unless you make that need known. And we encourage you to make that need known right now. Always stay. Always stay.